This one pretty much wrote itself. It did just start off with me checking Twitter and seeing this hashtag and going, oh, what's that about? Oh, what did the Labour Party do? Well, should, well done, I guess. But yeah, this little picture I made here, well, pretty much it's, it explains what they did. Pretty straightforward. Medical evacuations for people on Manus Island and Nauru. But this chud still gets to have the final say. No, like, yeah, business as usual. They got to have some tears of joy and some lip service us to be like we're the lesser of two evils go us but that's why it's so amazing because you can find out what's in these acts and bills you can read it yourself and you'd expect politicians to read them granted the migration act of 1958 is like two parts with each part being 500 pages long but still i made a video it's called how to profit off a prison and there's information in that that will be quite helpful in understanding what i'm going to talk about in this video actually if you leave if you mute this one go watch the other one when it's done meet me back you'll you'll miss the uh muppets do a dumpster fire aka australian politicians but yeah i, I need to show people how ridiculous these people are they're a meme and if anything you should come away with this next bit with a good understanding on the difference between policy and politics we're gonna have them right there in front of you and usually policy will beat politics because one's usually true one's usually sh full of shit all right we'll start off with fucking the prime minister just, Thank just you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister explain to the House what is required for strong borders and for keeping Australians safe and secure? Okay, just quickly, uh, the act here on the side, that's just the content table for volume one and volume two, and just having it there makes what is going to be said in this question time by some ministers obviously a lie. Like, anybody can work it out. And the guy that asked the question, uh, they're from the same team, so that's his boy, so he's asking a question that he's like, yeah, ask me this, I'll smash it out the park. National security policy to keep Australians safe and secure you need to understand and appreciate the threats that the nation faces. You need to ensure that you have a plan to address those threats, and I outline that plan that has been working for Australia under our government on Monday of this week to the National Press Club that addresses those threats. You have to be prepared to resource that plan by ensuring you have economic policies that provide for a stronger economy and that you have the budget management skills to bring the budget back into balance so you can support those important investments to keep Australians safe and secure. These are Here we go. All right, we'll get into what these so-called threats are shortly, but I just had to take a moment to appreciate that old mate, I stopped the boats with his little trophy, wants to then use Australian taxpayer dollars to build a replica of the Endeavour from the first fleet to sail around Australia or something. So Scott, I stopped the boats, I'll build the boats, Morrison. Yes, great plan, strategy, protection of the country, douchebag. Security policy in this country. But you know, there's one thing more important than all of that. More important than all of those things. You've got to have the conviction to take the action and follow through. Yeah. That's what you've got to have. You've got to have the medal, you've got to have the ticker, you've got to have the resolve to actually see things through and implement these decisions and not roll over to whatever wind might blow your way uh, to make you compromise Australia's national security and trade it away. That will never happen under a Liberal National Coalition yeah. government, Mr Speaker, but it did happen in this place this week by the leader of the Labor Party when he rolled over, Mr Speaker, and compromises and traded away Australia's border protection. Now, I wonder why he would do that, Mr Speaker, but I think it's pretty simple to understand. You don't value what you never built. Now, remember, I told you what they did. They wanted refugees to be able to get medical help. That is what this big threat to our national security is. Letting people that we've detained get medical help. It's all there in writing. That's the thing. So the policy was to get people medical treatment and they've made the politics somehow that Australia is now less safe. And remember, old mate Minister of Home Affairs gets the final say. Bill Shorten's facial expression really says it all though. Good on you, Bill. Oh, and you can tell that the Prime Minister feels very, very proud of himself with his final line here. Oh, it's a ripper. Every time we have brought legislation into this place on national security legislation, yeah. he has always sought to drag it down to the lowest common denominator and then claim some form of bipartisanship. There is not a cigarette papers difference between us. There is a phone book. And I don't know if it's just me, but how they keep saying borders, there's a voice in my head just yelling, we're a 
fucking island. Whenever they say something's happening with our borders, I just keep thinking, oh shit, is something gonna go down between Queensland and New South Wales? Because I don't really count a border if it's with the ocean, which is the entire country. Ugh. But all right, time to go on to the talking toe. Yeah, he looks like a toe. Minister, update the house on the importance of maintaining Australia's strong and consistent border protection policies. Is the minister aware of any threats to the integrity of Australia's borders? The minister for home affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for Bonner for his question. And everybody on this side of the house understands that you need to get border protection right. We need to make sure that we don't see kids drown at sea or go into detention. And Mr. Speaker, this government has worked day and night to stop people arriving illegally by boat, and we've got the kids out of detention. We have closed 19 detention centres. And Mr. Speaker, we don't want to see a return to the desperate days that we saw when Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard were in control of the Labor Party. But I fear we are watching a rerun of that train wreck under this leader of the opposition. As people now understand, the bill that was rushed through by the Leader of the Opposition and the Greens in this chamber and the Senate this week, Mr Speaker. As people start to look at the implications of that bill, people realise how dangerous that piece of legislation was. There, right there. I'll take that as a confession that this is a load of shit. They've stopped children dying. It's border protection. So we're protecting our borders from boatfuls of children. And just because the people that voted yes for this could recognize that if you have people in your custody and then you deny them medical treatment and then they die, you're automatically a bad guy. And then the liberals are there going, ooh, an amendment on the Migration Act. Let's say they're going to let pedophiles in. Brilliant. Yeah, election year. We've got this. And you see, the liberals only use news networks that will let them just talk shit. So you know that they're talking some serious shit when Sky News has to call out their bullshit. It's that's not what... true, though, Michael McCormack, that rapists and murderers would come here. A, uh, well, it could not... be if they... It, 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 it could well be if that... And, and look, at the end of the day, uh, those people who are in regional processing centres, if they had a valid case to be in Australia, uh, you know, th there are ways and means to get here. There are ways and means to get But there are provisions in the bill that says, like Laura, Laura said there, you know, that for ministerial discretion on security, on serious criminal behaviour... Uh, so I'm just, or well, the point I'm making is... And then it can, goes to can, a panel. It goes to the minister and then that, it goes to a panel. But that's, panel on the medi overturn. but that's only on the medical... Well, the panel can't the security ministerial discretion. And, and not, on, not on the security they can't. Well, but you can get a panel that overturns a minister's decision and, and the panel can be made up of people who, who have who have activist views. But that's only on the medical component, not on security or well, criminal grounds. That's doctors. the minister who decides. Well, you can get activist doctors who, who think, you know, activist everybody... Activist doctors don't have any effect on character and criminal grounds. That's, that's the point. Well, the fact is I, I still believe that uh, you could get a panel made up of people who have got different opinions than, uh, than our strong border but protection... But it derives, Mr Speaker, from Section 501 of the Migration Act, and there are 12 parts to that act. The difficulty is that with Labor's approach, they have abandoned 11 of the 12 sections. So it means, Mr Speaker, somebody coming from Manus or Nauru, under the Leader of the Opposition's now law, that person could come to our country. Now, I don't believe, Mr Speaker, that the Australian public support that. I don't believe that the Australian public want to see kids back on boats or drowning at sea. But I can say to you, Mr Speaker, what has happened this week is the Labor Party has completely undermined their own credibility. They went to the last election promising the Australian public that their policy would be no different to that of the coalition. The reality... Where do I even start? Okay, first of all, if Labor had promised to do the same thing as the Liberals, I'd be so disappointed. If and I won't go too far into the racist, xenophobic thing because it's a, I don't really care what he thinks of people in detention centres, I care about what he does. And he can speak for himself, as you can tell, you heard the same thing I did. But before we go back to Peter, I reckon we should have a quick little flashback. Back in time. Back to two decades ago. Okay, it's 2001. The term boat people is regularly used in the average Australian vocabulary. The Twin Towers went down, so Islamophobia swept the entire world. Another event from that year, which probably may have been seen as a political jackpot by old mate, the eyebrow with legs. And that was a Tampa, a ship full of boat people, but not just boat people, Muslim boat Boat people. Whoa. And growing up, you kind of see, like, whoa, these boat people are mainly or even only talked about in an election year. I wonder what that is all about. 
So I find it amazing in a depressing way that they're still doing this. They're still rolling with the same shit. Around the country, that this leader of the opposition would be able to turn back boats where it's safe to do so? Of course not, Mr. Speaker. The people smugglers understand that Labor's weak on border protection. What the fuck do you mean? I'm pretty sure if your life is in danger or your situation is that shit that you're willing to get in a boat to go to another country, I don't think you give a shit on what party's in power. And the people smuggling, the people smugglers. Why is it always we just go deter them so we'll lock up the refugees and people seeking asylum? That's like if somebody stole your TV and then when you found out who took it, your TV spends a night in jail. Now what is the core of this issue here? Are Australians just really racist or xenophobic to anyone that comes here, especially by boat? Or could it be that the Liberals have nothing else to run off? They've got no policies and they've been fear-mongering about boats, well, for pretty much my entire life anyways. And I know you already know the answer to this if you've watched my video, How to Profit Off a Prison. And another video I did that is really relevant to this one, but I didn't do it in the way that I did it. I probably would have forgotten. But because I thought I'd frame them and just leave them there, I still have the most ridiculous piece of language, like a salad of words, which is now our law. And drumroll please, it was in the dodgy as fuck creation of the Department of Home Affairs. Like, I didn't realise till just recently, right now really, but I get to say, I told you so. The proof's there, months ago. I try to warn yous. But if you put these agencies in the same department and put that bold reptilian at the head of it. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly Member go Blair wrong? Has a call. <laughs> Members on my right. That's right. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members my on question... my right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to Minister for Home Affairs. The financial review reports the government has a $423 million contract with the secretive Paladin Group, a group registered to a beach shack run by a director charged with fraud and money laundering, and which is charging taxpayers $20 million a month for services worth just $3 million. Can the Minister guarantee this almost half a billion dollar contract meets the probity required for the spending of taxpayers' money? The Minister of Home Affairs has the call. So, Mr Speaker, I'm actually quite touched, I've got to say. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't get much of a chance to ask a question. He doesn't ask questions very regularly in this place. And Mr. Speaker, you can see why. Oh yeah, I see why too, because when he asks a question, he asks one hell of a goddamn good question. And anyone want to take bets on whether the reptilian gets even close to answering it? That's right, nowhere near. Just kind of just throw insults. But yeah, nah, if you want quality over quantity, that's your guy right there. The question of the hour. Now, I'll answer it. I'll answer it for the Minister of Home Affairs. I'll just play the song I made for the occasion and show you the things I've been collecting over the week. Money! And billions and billions and billions! Excellent! Mm, wonder of you. you will make lots of money! For me! Billions and billions and billions and
Billions and billions and billions and this nay lip, this nay lip, this nay lip, billions and billions and billions and this nay lip, this nay lip, this nay lip, billions and billions and billions and Where I personally would let you in Australia if you just wanted to be here. Because I don't blame you. Especially if you're willing to get in a dinghy to get here. I would probably reward you a bravery medal for... I couldn't do that with the... There's sharks out there. Now, I didn't want to do any original artwork for this video because they don't deserve it. Politicians don't deserve it. So I was going to put it all into the next one and I need help deciding what would be best. I want to do something that I can put somewhere or leave somewhere that might at least at the minimum get other people thinking about the situation. But I had just a quick one that came to my mind was put up a sign near the airport, somewhere where it won't get taken down too quickly that just says, Welcome to Australia and good job for choosing to fly because if you didn't, we probably would chuck you in a detention centre or something on an island far away where you probably have a shit time. My other idea I had while I was walking home was if I quickly ask people from generations where their only way of getting here probably was by a ship, ask them about it, research and then start to sketch it out and for the person and I'll, while I'm doing it I'll talk about Nauru and Manus Island and Christmas Island but then I'll get a lovely old Australian that migrated here probably long before I was born to have a lovely picture of the way they got here and we can all announce that we're all boat people because like I've said Australia is a fucking island but yeah I would love some more ideas so if you can help us out that'd be great oh that's right I almost forgot that not everyone is doing it for the love. Some people are still pieces of shit that will hate people for the sake of it. But this is what the um handy thing about corrupt politicians are. Yeah, see? Look how I did that. You can hate people with a different skin tone to you or whatever, somehow. Even in Australia, I guess, somehow you can still hate them for being on a... Whatever they've put in your head and you've convinced is your actual feelings. You can keep that if you really want, but then you should probably be, like, pissed off about how much money we've been rolled by these people. Like, politicians will rob us to lock them up, and it's just a vicious cycle of corruption and abuse of human rights. So, one way or another, like money, hate money like people hate people you can be mad about this it will unite us we can all hate peter dunton together yay but yeah i think one of the most soul-crushing things about this entire thing other than the situation that we put people in after the traumatic shit they would have already had to go through because my first thought was why don't we help improve the countries they're fleeing from if it's a big problem to people and they don't want them here then give them a reason not to leave but then i worked out how to profit off a prison i worked out that's the last thing they want to do so it's a very messy intertwined pit of snakes so i'm doing what i can i hope you do too have have a lovely day. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, and free the people on Manus Island and Nauru. Categorise. Look, firstly, uh, is it the intention to, when people are transferred uh, back to Australia under the provisions of the amendments which passed through the Parliament last week, that they be transferred to Christmas Island? Yes. It is. Yes. That is that is the policy of the government. It's the government's policy to transfer people who are so sick that they can't get appropriate medical treatment on Manus Island or in Port Moresby or on Nauru to Christmas Island. Yes. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm not accepting the, the characterisation. It's the government's policy to bring persons... You're going to bring them to Christmas Island? Un, under, the, under the Act that soon will be assented to, to bring people to Christmas Island. Now, that Clearly. is outrageous. Well, uh, it's not for me to comment on, or uh, nor for Senator McKim. Well, actually, it is for me to we're, comment we're on. We're here Chair. to ask questions. 
Now, well, clearly, I've got a number that raises a number of questions. Clearly, Senator McKim, it goes without saying that um, if specialised treatment oh, is only available in the mainland, then then the mainland will, of course, be utilised. You're going to transfer them in the first instance to Christmas Island. That is the policy of the government. Yes. Well, apart from uh, the needless, hang on, hang on. Apart from the needless and wanton cruelty that is inherent in that decision, <laughs> that is a clear denial of the clear intent of the parliament, which is that people get access to better medical treatment, which is not available on Christmas Island, Mr Pizzullo. 